You're listening to The Fugue from Bloch's Concerto Grosso No. 1. In a fugue, a melody is passed to each orchestral section methodically so as to keep the overall work interesting while demonstrating the composer's technical skill. This fugue, however, also undertakes a different task. While the melody is being passed around, it is inverted, reversed, and stretched in order to create harmonic complexity using only the variations on the theme. Just as this fugue takes a single theme through multiple variations in order to produce a complex message, Sao Suexian, the author of the Great Qing novel, The Dream of the Red Chamber, plays with the theme of truth or reality in order to convey his complex message. In one such case, Jia Baoyu, one of the primary characters of the novel, dreams of his doppelganger, a boy named Zhen Baoyu, whom he has heard not only bears his name, but also his likeness and temper. In the dream, the boy he finds is not only exactly like him in likeness, but he also lives in a similar house, in a similar garden, and even seems to have the same dreams. Now, it would be one thing if this dream were just a fiction, as a dream might represent in the Western tradition. But for the Chinese, there is no telling that we are not in a dream right now. A story goes by the Taoist philosopher Zhuangzi. Once upon a time, I, Chuangzhou, Thought, dreamt I was a butterfly, fluttering hither and thither, to all intents and purposes, a butterfly. I was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was Cho. Soon I waked, and there I was, veritably myself again. Now I don't know whether I was a man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. In the Taoist tradition, the dream is a metaphor for life and a means to understanding how to live it. Rather, Perhaps the entirety of life is a dream, but there is no way of telling. One such Taoist story describes a man dissatisfied with the path he has chosen in life, walking into a pillow handed to him by the Taoist immortal Nu, which transports him across time and space so he could take another path in life, only to find out that upon waking it was all a dream and that he'd rather live his current life anyway. The man does not need to fall asleep to dream, nor can he tell when he has entered the dream completely. Sao Suexian draws upon this Chinese understanding of dreams to complicate the distinctions between true and false. In fact, each Bao Yu himself bears a family name which is a homophone for true, which is Zhen, and false, which is Jia. When in the dream, the false and the true Bao Yus become indistinguishable from each other, truth becomes fiction, and fiction truth. Listen to how Bao Yu wanders into this dream after finding out about his namesake where he finds his doppelganger resting in a place just like his own residence and how his sense of reality begins to fall apart both within the dream and after he has woken. His feet were carrying him along in no particular direction and presently he found himself inside a courtyard. He looked around him in some surprise. Strange, there's even a place like Green Delights here. He mounted the steps of the veranda and walked inside the building. Someone was lying there on the bed. On the other side of the room were some maids, some of them sewing, some of them giggling over a game they were playing. Presently, the person on the bed, it was a youth, could be heard to sigh, and one of the maids laughingly inquired what he was sighing for. Aren't you asleep, Baoyu? I suppose you are worried about your cousin's illness again and imagining all sorts of foolish things about her. Baoyu heard this with some astonishment. He listened while the youth on the bed replied, I heard grandmother say there's another Baoyu in the capital who is exactly like me, but I didn't believe her. I've just been having a dream in which I went to a large garden and met some girls there who called me a nasty creature and wouldn't have anything to do with me. I managed to find this value's room, but he was asleep. What I saw was only an empty shell lying there on the bed. I was wondering where the weird person could have got to. I came here looking for Baoyu. Are you Baoyu then? Baoyu could not help blurting out. The youth leaped down from the bed and seized Baoyu by the hands. So you are Baoyu and this isn't a dream after all? Of course it isn't a dream, said Bao Yu. It couldn't be more real. Just then, someone arrived with a summons. The master wants to see Bao Yu. For a moment, the two Bao Yus were stunned, and then one Bao Yu hurried off, and the other Bao Yu was left calling after him. Come back, Bao Yu! Come back, Bao Yu! Aroma heard him calling his own name in his sleep and shook him awake. Where's Bao Yu? she asked him jokingly. Though awake, Bao Yu had not yet regained consciousness of his surroundings. He pointed to the doorway. He's only just left. He can't have got very far. You're still dreaming, Aroma said, amused. Rub your eyes and have another look. That's the mirror. You're looking at your own reflection in the mirror. 
Bao Yu doesn't just lose his sense of reality, Bao Yu loses his sense of self. This is because Cao Xuechen not only plays with dreams as other worlds, but he plays with the dream as a mirror. The cause of Bao Yu's dream becomes indistinguishable from a mirror when he wakes, so the dream reflects some part of Bao Yu's internal state. When additionally one considers that Bao Yu has not only dreamt strictly of himself, but of his real-world counterpart, Zhen Bao Yu, the dream now serves multiple purposes. It is a mirror to Bao Yu's desire to know his namesake. It is a mirror within the narrative to establish the two Bao Yu's as indistinguishable from each other. And the dream is a means for Bao Yu, and perhaps the reader, to understand a deep truth. When one then examines the quality of Zhen and Zha Bao Yu, and how they choose to live their life, then this dream serves as a mirror for the reader to reflect on their own path.